From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Ready or not, the November election is now barely six months away. While much of the attention is on the Biden-Trump rematch, here in Rhode Island, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is kicking off his bid for a fourth term. Fresh polling data is giving us a glimpse of where the veteran Democrat stands with voters and how Governor Dan McKee is weathering the Washington Bridge crisis. We break it all down with our political roundtable. Plus, the opioid crisis has been rich fodder for authors, including Rhode Island's own Philip Isle who's out with a new book on the so-called pill mill killer. What I'll learn from his 15 years of research and writing this week on Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics editor Ted Nisi. Author Phil Isle will join us on the second half of the program. But right now for a political roundtable, we welcome back 12 News political analyst Joe Fleming and from the Boston Globe, Steph Machado. Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Um, let's start uh, with the Morning Consult quarterly survey, which is a, a rolling poll from uh, this time around January 1st to March 31st, the first quarter, and their sample size is what, 923 yep. okay, registered voters. And we will begin with numbers on Governor Dan McKee. They are on the screen. These are job approval numbers. 49% approve, 41% disapprove, 10% of those who were surveyed were unsure. I believe the margin of error on this is uh, 3%. I should point out that his job approval rating ticked up over the winter. It was 45% uh, in the fall. Now, as you can see, it's up to 49%. Joe, you say this is a positive thing for Governor Dan McKee, and I just want to state the obvious. Viewers see a number under 40, 50%, and they might think you're crazy <laughs> to say that, that that's a positive number. I but those are good numbers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those, those are very good numbers for the governor for the simple reason. the last This is done over a three-month period. During that time, we had the Washington Bridge problems, and the conventional wisdom was Dan McKee is sinking because of the Washington Bridge. This shows just the opposite. His numbers have stabilized and actually have gone up a little bit. So if I'm the governor, I'm happy with a 49%. Keep in mind, we've had other governors, even Gina Raimondo, when she was running for re-election, had a lot lower job ratings than 49% and still won re-election. So if I'm Dan McKee, I'm feeling pretty good about these numbers. Now, the question is, can he maintain this, or is this, this just a little bump for him? Yeah, I think if I'm Dan McKee, I, I feel like these numbers should reset the narrative a little after a rocky couple of months. Uh, you know, people talking about, will he run in 2026? Is all this talk about Helena folks wanting a rematch? But, you know, if I'm sitting at 49%, a Democratic incumbent governor in a Democratic state, that's a solid position to start a re-election campaign for him. So it's going to be interesting to watch as he makes that calculation over the next year, mm -hmm. year and a half. Yeah, I think we've all been wondering whether or not the bridge would affect him politically and how exactly it's going to affect him, particularly with his re-election. But a lot of uh, people in Rhode Island do not use the bridge. They don't live in the East Bay. They don't live in Providence. They don't have to drive over it. So they're seeing him on TV handling it and may not be experiencing the traffic. So like a crisis bump. I mean, we've seen uh, this before. Governor Don Kachiri with the Station Nightclub saw a bump early days of the pandemic. Governor Gina Raimondo. Uh, an extraordinary bump from yeah, her. Yeah, knock it, it, off, knock it off uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, phrase. Yeah. Uh, saw a bump from that. Is that what you're saying here? Yeah, Maybe it's a crisis bump yeah, for yeah. him? We'll have to see as the numbers go on. But. Yeah. Joe, you agree? Well, I agree, definitely. The thing is, though, a lot of these people just see him as a positive getting the bridge fixed because they don't use the bridge. If you're in Northern Rhode Island, you probably don't use that bridge much at all, so it doesn't affect you. But now you see the governor out there saying, okay, we're getting it done. Now they get the third lane open. It seems to be moving a lot smoother. This was, of course, all before the third right, lane. Right, before the third lane. But now with the third lane open, the election is not for two years down the road. This whole issue could be in the past at this point. And that's another good point. He has the benefit of time here, right? right. This is taking place far away from the next election for governor. Um, you don't have people run commercials. You don't have uh, rivals mm. attacking him mm -hmm. on this. Even the Republicans have not been putting out many statements about the bridge situation. There's been some things here and there. So you also don't have, because we're not in election time, a really organized effort to you know, raise the political pain on the governor over this beyond the daily news headlines. And by the way, we still don't have the forensic audit detailing whose fault it is that the bridge day of reckoning. failed, mm -hmm. right? The day of reckoning, as the governor calls it. And so there hasn't been a definitive sense of who, if anyone, in the McKee administration, in Rydot, is to blame or failed in this situation. And that could change things. Before, I want to talk more about the bridge, particularly money and all that. But this is Newsmakers, and uh, sometimes we can get in the weeds on uh, the wonky stuff. And briefly from both of you, uh, Joe, when you conduct polls for 12 right. News, those usually take 
place over a period of say five days, whatever it takes you to get to that right. sample size, right? Morning Consult does a does this survey over an entire quarter, and I'm curious to get your and Ted's opinion on, on that methodology. Well, it, it is a long time, because things do change. And again, a poll's just a snapshot, so we do it in like four or five days. That's a long exposure. <laughs> right, that's a long exposure. So people's opinions, there might be an issue at the beginning that affects it. But when you look at their numbers, and you look at local polls that we've done in the past, the numbers pretty much are close together. Not exactly the same, but closer together. Uh, what we don't know in this poll simply is it, how much of his support was strongly think job approval or somewhat job approval. So they don't break that out for us, though. Yeah, yeah. just briefly, I, I, when these polls first started being done almost a decade ago now, I was a little skeptical. It was such an unusual thing to do a poll over right. three. Yeah. But we've now had enough time to see that Morning Consult is in the ballpark. Right. And it's the only regularly scheduled poll about Rhode Island's governor and senators right now. So I, I do think it's something that gives us, every poll has a margin of error. I think this gives us a sense of where things are. All right, let's talk about the bridge. Governor McKee this week sent the General Assembly some amendments to his budget plan, including tapping some remaining co COVID money, $20 million to tuck away in case it's needed for infrastructure projects, but especially leaning into the Washington Bridge. I asked uh, Speaker Joe Shikarchi what he, what he thought of that in an interview on Wednesday. Take a listen. We'll have a public hearing before the House Finance Committee. I hope that uh, $20 million is the right number, but that's $20 million that we were going to use somewhere else in the budget that we now have to earmark for the bridge. So it will impact the overall budget. And as I told you and uh, Ted, there is a tremendous amount of asks outside of the budget. We're over $1 billion of asks that are outside the budget. So this is being added to that as well. So we're going to have to do a, you know, a prioritization of that, and we will. To the speaker's point there, even though the $20 million is money from the feds, it could have been used, as he says, uh, somewhere else. Um, but this is all under the backdrop of we have no idea how much the Washington Bridge is going to cost. Right, and I do wonder if they want to know that answer before appropriating yes. money that could be spent elsewhere, particularly because when P, uh, P. Buttigieg was here, the Transportation Secretary, he suggested that the feds could, Ted, you interviewed him, the feds could spend put a lot of money into this Washington Bridge repair. So do state leaders want to know how much the feds are going to pay before they appropriate state money it is federal COVID relief money but it's in the state hands and can be used on other stuff and there's an impending deadline to spend that american rescue plan money ted before we go to break any any thought on that i mean this could could we see how much the bridge is going to cost before the budget is finalized that's not expected because uh the contract's not supposed to be done till the end of july the budget should be done by the end of june but um i do think it, it frankly it makes sense i can see why mckee's budget officials thought look this money has to be obligated by the end of the year under the american rescue plan act we know we're going to have some exposure of bridge costs let's put 20 million dollars away they left themselves a little um out where they could put it towards something else just in case um so i can see why they did it all right we're going to take a break here on newsmakers when we come back in the wake of the signature scandal, what is the political future for Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos? Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers and a political roundtable. I'm Tim White alongside Ted Nisi, Steph Machado from the Boston Globe, and 12 News Politics Editor Joe Fleming. Uh, Joe? You just gave him my title. Oh, 12 News <laughs> Thank you. Political Analyst. <laughs> Well, I didn't mean to demote you. You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. Uh, no thanks. What a, I want to talk about Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos. Uh, she appeared on 12 News at 4 with Kim Colonian. Take a short listen here. Do you expect to seek re-election in 2026? Right now I'm concentrated on working and doing the work for the people of the state of Rhode Island. And I can tell you, um, every day I wake up trying to figure out what I can do to improve the quality of life of the people of the state of Rhode Island. If they want to give me an opportunity to serve them again, I'd be honored. So, Joe, um, is, is the lieutenant governor poking her head up to check the horizon post-signature scandal now? I mean, this is really, uh, we haven't seen her in the press right. that much, and here she is live on our air. I think she's testing the land out there to see if there's a possibility for her to run. I think the race for Congress really hurt her from being the favorite at the beginning to dropping way down, I think finishing, what, fourth place, uh, not getting a lot of votes. I think a lot of people are probably looking at that race as they're a very weak person that they could run for lieutenant governor, possibly win, and four years down the road, be in shape to run for governor if Dan McKee runs and gets reelected. 
So it could be a stepping stone to the governor's office. So I think a lot of politicians in the state, Democrats and Republicans, may look at that office more seriously this year than in the past. Of course, um, the signature scandal might continue to linger because right. someone right. Uh, was charged in that case, and uh, that could hang around for a bit. All right, I want to shift gears to the federal delegation, Talk, go back to the morning consult poll, this time with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Of course, we should note he just announced he's running for another six-year term for the November elections. Not a surprise there. Let's take a look at his numbers. 50% approval rate, disapproval of 35%, uh, and 16% of the people aren't sure here. Um, Want to note that he has two Republican challengers, Ray McKay and State Rep Patricia Morgan. On the numbers here, Ted, good, bad, and different? I, I assume if I'm Senator Whitehouse's team, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. Starting at 50% as a Democratic incumbent in a Democratic state in a presidential year when Democratic turnout is higher, that's not a bad place to be. And of course, we have to talk about his financial advantage. Mm -hmm. Whitehouse is sitting on mm -hmm. $3.6 million. Uh, Patricia Morgan has less than $200,000. And Ray McKay, the other Republican seeking their nomination, has about $10,000. So if, some, if things got tighter over the course of the year, somehow, maybe unexpectedly, White House has a lot of resources to try to bring his numbers back up. But right now, um, you know, I always remind people just to be candid about it. Rhode Island hasn't elected a Republican to the Senate not named Chafee since, I think, 1930 or 1932. So that's how hard it will be for a Republican to win. Uphill battles, Steph, then it sounds like. Yeah, ex exactly. And I think both of those uh, potential Republican nominees will be underdogs in the race. Um, Representative Morgan, you know, at one point was the Republican minority leader, had a little bit more of a high profile in the Republican Party when she ran uh, unsuccessfully for governor, for example. She is now have, has less of a profile, particularly within the Republicans. I believe she doesn't even caucus with them, mm -hmm. if, if I have that correctly. Um, and so it would be an uphill battle for either of those candidates. Well, we're talking about White House, Joan, yeah. I want to hear from you on that. Uh, let's bring up. Uh, Senator Jack Reed's numbers. I, I like to just put White House's uh, job mm -hmm. approval numbers in context, context with uh, Senator Jack Reed's, who's are even a little bit higher, 58 percent approval, 27 percent disapproval, and 15 percent uh, aren't sure. Joe, you're going to talk about those numbers don't surprise me at all, because every time we poll, Jack Reed's the number one in job approval in the state of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't surprise me. We should, Senator Whitehouse, keep this in mind. You can't beat him if you don't have an issue. You need an issue to bring him down. And there's no issues now in the voters' mind that would hurt uh, Sheldon the White House. And again, when you have $3.6 million, you can get your message out. Your opponents can't get the message out. So uh, Senator Whitehouse is in a very strong position right now. Yeah, and I think there used to be a thought around Senator Whitehouse. Was he too liberal, uh, maybe, for voters? Was he too partisan, you know, uh, versus, mm. you know, Jack Reed, who's very, you know, we know, straight arrow, military guy. But look, Rhode Islanders have twice now had a chance to see how he operates in the Senate and render a verdict, and he got over 60 percent both times. Mm -hmm. So there's just not a lot of reason to think Rhode Islanders right. are suddenly going to turn on him when they previously reelected him twice doing, I'd say, much the same thing he's been doing in this term. You know what? I think we do have time for this. I want to play real quick. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo was on 60 Minutes this past Sunday. Veteran correspondent and Wheaton College alum yes. Leslie Stahl uh, <laughs> asked Rhode Island's former governor if she had higher aspirations. Take a listen. So here comes the inevitable, obvious question mm -hmm. that you know is coming your way. Mm. You are on a list of future presidential candidates. Does that sound good to you? Is it appetizing? What sounds good to me is being the best Commerce Secretary there's ever been. Well, wow, talk of a former governor running for president, <laughs> former governor of Rhode Island. Well, and you know, I mean, that's not uh, the last time a Wheaton College grad uh, <laughs> interviewed her, which was me last year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not quite as big a profile for that interview, I guess. Don't but tell she, yourself thank short. you, thank you, bud. Um, you know, I said I asked her about the same thing, and she said, "Oh, I don't know about president." And I said, "Well, it's not a no," and she said, "No, but it's not a yes." Mm -hmm. I think she likes this conversation. I think it's good for her standing in Washington to even be. You know, what's the saying about the Academy Awards? It's an honor just to be nominated. Nominated, yes. right? You know, in this case, it's, it's an honor to just to be mentioned, right? <laughs> and to be someone prominent enough to be in that discussion. But I think, you know, we know she has problems with the left. There are all sorts of prominent national Democrats, uh, the vice president, uh, governor of California, governor of Michigan, who are also going to look at this, um, regardless of what happens with Biden. So I'm skeptical we're going to see Gina Raimondo actually run. But I, I don't think she minds that it's being talked about on the top-rated TV program for News in America. All right, Steph Machado and Joe Fleming, thank you so much for joining us on the program. When we come back, a new book by a local author on the so-called pill mill killer. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. Tim White, along with Ted Nisi, our guest on the second half here is Phil Isle, and he is the author of a great new book out called Prescription for Pain. And uh, Phil, I just want to put a real fine point on how long you've been working on this book. Let's show some video from the last time you were on Newsmakers, 2016. It was actually our old set. Uh, discussing your public records. Look, oh my gosh, we, we look all so, look. Look how dark your hair is, Ted. Uh, this, no. We were discussing your public records battle with the, the federal government. Yeah. This has been a really long journey for you. It has indeed. It was in 2009 when I first learned that my dad knew a guy who we had gone to medical school with who was convicted or charged at the time with a massive prescription drug dealing scheme in southern Ohio that prosecutors said led to the deaths of a number of his patients. And I thought, what on earth happened to this guy? I was 23, 24 years old. And I haven't been working on the project every day since then. There have been a lot of detours. I was the editor of the Providence Phoenix. I did some teaching. But uh, from that beginning in 2009 up to a couple weeks ago in 2024, this project has always been on the burner. Um, Paul Volkman who is in a federal prison. He's a subject of your, uh, right. of your book in Arizona. I looked it up actually in the Bureau of Prisons locator right, right. before we walked yep. on set. He's going to die in prison, right? I mean, most yes. likely unless some appeal happens. He was sentenced to four consecutive life sentences. You covered the sentencing, right? I did, uh, yeah. What was that moment like in the courtroom? Well, at that point, he was estranged from his attorneys who was representing himself. This is a guy who has difficulty with relationships. And he tried to use it. He had also refused to testify at the trial. He tried to use this moment as kind of a way to testify. The judge really wasn't, wasn't really interested. But to give you a sense of his lack of remorse and his combativeness, he called the judge, at his own sentencing, a heinous criminal. Mm. Um, and now, they don't recommend that necessarily, <laughs> right? <laughs> they certainly don't. Attorneys. But at that point, he didn't have an attorney even advising him. Hmm. Um, there are so many reasons why this case sticks out. Of course, there's a the personal angle, but among the dozens of doctors convicted of these kinds of crimes, uh, illegal activity related to opiates in the course of the, uh, the opiate epidemic, I haven't found a sentence that matches or exceeds that one. It's really a high watermark for consecutive life terms. It's astonishing. I cover a lot of federal court. I just want to say mm -hmm. I've never covered a sentencing with that high a yeah. sentence. Yeah. Uh, well, no, and then particularly because as you point out in the book, Phil, he wasn't charged with murder. You would think right. with that level of a sentence it was right. murder trip, but they right. were so appalled by his how he was just handing these right. pills out so willy-nilly seemingly that, that, that he was slapped with all that. Yeah. I think there were a lot of factors that go into the sentence. There was a lack of the lack of remorse. Mm -hmm. There was the fact that, unlike the majority of federal defendants, he didn't accept a plea deal, and so mm -hmm. it went to a trial. But also, and one of the things that I was really interested in the story was the area where his crimes took place, southern Ohio, right on the border of Kentucky and West Virginia. Really it, rural area. Appalachia. So. Totally. Yeah. You've totally. been there, right? I, oh, many times. Yeah. Ten times. Um, this is a part of the country that's one of the worst hit by prescription drugs, and in particular, these kind of cash-only, non-hospital-affiliated pain clinics like the one where Dr. Volkman was working. I, so I, I, I saw this online. One of the reviews, maybe it was Goodreads or Amazon somewhere, yeah. one of the people who wrote a review, and I just thought it was an interesting point, said, well, I hope Philip Isle never needs right. opioids for pain or something. The right. person obviously are trying to argue that right. this and similar journalism yeah. is going to make it harder for patients to get yeah painkillers that they need. Not necessarily responding right to that person, but, but bigger picture, how do you think about, Phil, how and whether opioids should be used at all after seeing just how bad abusing them can get? Well, well, I would say a few things. One, I always, I, I'm not a doctor. One of the reasons it took me 15 years was to feel like I could have the expertise or at least the, the to be informed enough to write on these complicated subjects. So I would advise people to talk to their doctors. <laughs> um, but I also want to say this is not an anti-opiate book. This is not an anti-pain patient book. I think one of the, it, Paul Volkman, who still maintains his innocence, uh, claims that he was this champion of underserved chronic pain patients who couldn't get the help that they needed elsewhere. And this book is one long fact check of that claim and a lot of other claims, and they don't really stand up uh, to scrutiny. I think I came away feeling like Paul Volkman, because he was working at a cash-only clinic with armed guards that was owned by a woman who didn't have any kind of medical background. Uh, his prescriptions were, you know, local pharmacies declined to, to fill them. He was really uh, not a great uh, poster child for the cause of chronic pain uh, treatment in this country. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I came away 
certainly there, there's a much bigger story to tell about Purdue Pharma and the opiate epidemic, and that was another reason why I was so interested in this story was the context. His crimes took place 2003 to 2006 at a time when there were all these forces in our country uh, really encouraging people, doctors, uh, to treat pain more aggressively, and, and Volkman um, it, it is a character from that era. So mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a crime story, but it's also a snapshot of a particular era in our country's history. This hit the bookshelves, what, last month? April 9th, this a month. A a April 9th. Uh, again, congratulations. Thank you. Have you heard from Paul Volkman? I haven't. Um, he stopped talking to me a few times in the course of my research. I let him know the book was coming out in the fall. I sent him another short letter uh, a few days ago letting him know that the book was now out, what the title was. I said I would send him a copy uh, if he was interested. I still haven't heard back. Um, so you both have written a book. I've never written a book. And I'm actually just <laughs> curious on like a technical level as a, yes. a fellow journalist. Yes. We only have a little over a minute left, Phil. But how do you organize the amount of material you yeah. need for, you know, I write stories that I'm like, whoa, that was 800 words. Wow, yeah. that was a big story today. Yeah. You know, you're writing a book this long. How did you keep organized, especially over 15 years? Spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, that's really uh, helpful. Spreadsheets, spreadsheets and shoeboxes. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a shoebox of Volkman's <laughs> letters in my closet. I certainly didn't <laughs> want to lose those. I scanned them and uploaded them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, uh, it's, it was a massive structural undertaking to just keep track. You know, some of the stuff I use in the book was from reporting I did in 2009. Mm. So uh, a lot of different hard drives, boxes. <laughs> Backups. It, it I oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 Smart. It, it was a major undertaking. Um, did you write as you researched or did you gather it all and then hit the paper? Um, I wrote as I researched, but I was writing at a time, 25, 26 years old, when I don't think I had the skill that I have now. So a lot of the older stuff, the earlier drafts, which were kind of cheap Truman Capote knockoffs. Um, <laughs> those, uh, hey, did, if you're going to emulate someone, he's yeah, not a bad right, person exactly. to emulate. Those didn't make it into the final book, and that's a good thing. So it was Phil Isle, the 37, 38, 39-year-old <laughs> writer, who had the final say on what went into the book. And they say I'm a cheap Tim White knockoff, so it's not, I don't knock it. Um, I'm just curious, and I know you're probably like, it's like when you have a baby and they immediately ask you having another one, but do you think you'll write another book? I would love to, and I would love to revisit the Freedom of Information Act as a subject. Oh, well, Tim will buy that. Oh, one. I will buy that in bulk. <laughs> if you're going to do it's something, just else. a ploy to get back on the show. <laughs> <laughs> what, so 15 years. So what year we need to book him now? Yeah. Maybe? So we'll see you 15 years from now. Apparently. Sounds good. Hopefully it won't take that yeah. long. All right. The book is Prescription for Pain: How a Once Promising Doctor Became the Pill Mill Killer. Do you have any more book events coming up, Phil? Yeah, real quick. I'm headed out to D.C. and then Ohio, okay. uh, but I'll be back in Rhode Island probably in June and I. I hope to have a few more then. All right, look out for those book events. Phil Isle, great job. Thank Congratulations. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you for watching Newsmakers. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week.